Good morning. Good morning. Lovely. That uh, hymn we've just sung goes very well. Who? Oh, just looking around. Who remembers the pop group The Seekers? Ah, good, good. Um, do you remember their song, um, The Carnival Is Over? Da, 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 da. Yeah, that hymn goes very well with that, uh, that tune. Yeah. Yeah. You're all right, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> oh, there. <laughs> uh, there. Sorry, I've forgotten your name. A.D. A.D. AD. Uh, thank you, A.D., for uh, your, your music uh, uh, there. Uh, sometimes we take it for granted, don't we? And uh, it's good. Uh, thank you. I see uh, you use the same shampoo as I do. Uh, yeah. Wash and go. Uh, it's, uh, lovely. Lovely to be back with you again. And it's always good to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to share communion together. It is a real privilege we, we have uh, in doing that. And I've been asked to, uh, to speak on faithful in prayer. Um, so perhaps I should just say a few words and then we should have a prayer meeting uh, there. But uh, uh, hopefully uh, what the Lord's given me uh, will touch uh, hearts today. Uh, <clears throat> talking of uh, old uh, songs and hymns and that, there's, uh, there's a hymn with the chorus, Prayer Changes Things. It really changes things. I know prayer changes things. I dare you to try him. It will change things. When it feels like hope is gone, it's all gone. And you can't keep holding on. Don't give up on God. For prayer changes things. Yeah. It's uh, good. Some of these old choruses um, we go back to. I was brought up... Uh, through Boy Covenanters, if anybody remembers the, the youth group uh, there. Um, and we use the Elim Pentecostal chorus book. So on the victory side and all those kind of things. And it's good to remember those things, isn't it? It reminds us that we are on the victory side uh, there. Yeah. We might uh, be struggling in the odd battle, but the war is won. That's wonderful, isn't it? If you've got God's word with you, if you'd like to turn <clears throat> to Luke chapter 18, uh, this is what I felt uh, God was asking me to bring to you uh, this morning. So if you don't agree with it, then please take it up with him uh, and not with me uh, there. Luke chapter 18, and just uh, verses uh, 1 to 8 there. It says, uh, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night will he keep putting them off i tell you he will see that they get justice and quickly however when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth amen may the lord bless the reading of his word is jesus telling his disciples this parable about their need to pray and always not to give up or not to lose heart. 
It's a rather strange little story, isn't it? Uh, there, about a judge who neither fears God uh, nor has any respect for people. Uh, not a lot's changed, has it, over the centuries uh, there? She pests this widow woman uh, who is desperate for justice. Uh, she pesters the judge so much that the judge finally relents. And will not God, Jesus concludes, grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? That's us. Isn't that wonderful there? Indeed, God is no unjust judge, is he? Our God loves this world too much to judge it. For that famous verse in John 3.16 reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life there. What a promise. What a promise to hang on to. Yeah? For Jesus didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. But this parable raises a bit of an obvious question. Why did Jesus tell it to his disciples? Didn't they already know this? They'd been with him for some time. They'd seen Jesus going off uh, to pray, sometimes all night. They'd seen uh, God answer Jesus' prayer. So, why did they need to be reminded about it? Didn't they already know that they should pray always? In fact, weren't they already doing that? Apparently not. Apparently not. You don't tell someone to get more exercise if they're already exercising uh, daily. You can see from my slim figure that I go jogging every morning uh, and visit the gym uh, quite regularly. <coughs> I had my fingers crossed there, so. <laughs> yeah. You don't tell someone to pray always if they're already doing so. So Jesus told this parable to his disciples to encourage them to pray always, not to lose heart. Because even Jesus' disciples were not praying always, and then even they would occasionally get discouraged. It happens to everyone. Great saints, lowly sinners, you, me, we know, don't we, how important prayer is, but we all struggle with it. We all struggle with prayer. We all get discouraged in life. So what do we do about it? What does Jesus teach us? This is what I want us to wrestle with. I put that word in deliberately because sometimes it is a battle, isn't it? We do have to wrestle with it. We do have to, you know. Anybody ever watch the wrestling on the TV? No? Those who remember ITV when it first came out. Uh, BBC had got all the uh, things for all the other sports, uh, football and cricket and all these kinds. About the only thing that was free for ITV to take on was wrestling uh, there. My dad loved it. He you know, used to sit there enthralled uh, there. Um, but uh, God calls us to wrestle, to wrestle with these things that we struggle with. And that, I want us to wrestle with that today. Pray always so you don't lose heart. But first, let's think about the reason for today's parable. To pray always, not to lose heart. What does Jesus mean by that? Two things, I believe. First, Jesus means that these are connected. There are not two separate suggestions from Jesus. Praying always is connected to not losing heart. And when we lose heart, we often give up on praying. So maybe this would be better translated as pray always so you don't 
lose heart. So you don't lose heart. But what did Jesus mean by praying always? When I think of Jesus uh, telling us to pray always, uh, perhaps what he really meant was not that we should be praying 24-7 uh, there and uh, uh, put everything else to the side, but that we should uh, not give up on our praying. Not give up on our praying there. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on prayer. No matter how discouraging our life gets, no matter how long it seems to take God to answer our prayers, we should never give up, give up on God. We, we live in a, an instant world, don't we? We were just talking about that, about the tech, techie stuff uh, there um, with Brian uh, earlier on. You know, We live in an instant world, instant coffee. You can go to these uh, um, bank things outside the banks and get your instant money and always presume you've got it in the bank. Uh, funny, isn't it? They won't let you have it unless you've got it in there. Uh, but, yeah, and we... we sometimes expect God to be instant. If we think back, it took over 400 years for God to answer the prayers of the Israelites who were in slavery there in uh, Egypt. There. And, uh, you know, and do you think there was some 800 years between the prophecies of Isaiah and the other prophets there before the Messiah came. So, not that we've got 400 years or 800 years. I know some of us are getting, a, I'm not looking at you there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do, we do look, don't we, for the Lord to answer uh, there. But keep on, keep on, keep on praying uh, there. So, in that sense, let's pray always. No matter how life, discouraging life gets, no matter how long it seems to, to take God to answer our prayers. Before we get to know how to do this, let's think about some reasons why we don't do it already. We all go through periods, don't we, when we're not as active in our prayers as we know that we should be, if we're honest with ourselves there. Why is that? Why do we not pray always? Why do we not pray as we know that we, sh we should? I want to suggest three reasons. First, we all have times in our life when we just give up on prayer. Our prayers seem to go unanswered and we just quit. I think we can all relate to uh, Huckleberry Finn who shares his thoughts about prayer early in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He says this. He says, Miss Watson, who perhaps I don't know who she was uh, there, a Sunday school teacher or whatever, uh, told me to pray every day. And whatever I asked for, I would get. Bit of a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> uh, there. But it wasn't so. I tried it. Once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It wasn't any good to me without hooks. I tried prayer for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me. But she said I was just a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make it out no way. I sat down one time back in the woods and had a long think about it. I say to myself, I should really be speaking in a Southern American voice there. But, uh, um, if a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Deacon um, Wynn go back, get back the money he had lost on his pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff box that was stolen. Why can't Miss Watson, I like this, fat up, 
No, says I to myself, there ain't nothing in it. That was Huckleberry Finn's opinion of prayer. And we can feel a bit like that, can't we? Feel a bit like that. Yeah, and sometimes we give up on prayer because there ain't nothing in it. But even if we believe that there's something in it, we can sometimes get out of the habit of prayer. Why is that? Often it's because we do not prioritise prayer. Doing something about whatever we are dealing with often seems like a better idea than praying about it. And life keeps us so busy. Who has time for prayer? And when we try to quiet ourselves for prayer, life comes to us with everything it has to try and distract us. How many of us can relate to this very honest poem about prayer by Marie Howard? She says this, Every day I want to speak with you, obviously speaking to, to the Lord here, and every day something more important calls for my attention. The drugstore, the beauty products, the luggage I need to buy for the trip, even now I can hardly sit here. Among the falling piles of paper and clothing, the garbage trucks outside already screeching and banging, the mystics say that you are as close to me as my own breath. Why do I flee from you? My days and nights pour through me like complaints. And because a story I forgot to tell, help me. Even as I write these words, I'm planning to rise from the chair as soon as I finish this sentence. Who feels like that in their prayer time there? I must confess so often I do there. And, uh, you know, I know that God answers prayer, but a lot of the time I don't give God the opportunity to speak to me. To me, I'm bringing him all the, my woes and my troubles and my list of things uh, that I need to pray for, but then get up and walk away uh, on this one-sided conversation I have with the Lord there. John Bunyan said this, He who runs from God in the morning will scarcely find him for the rest of the day. How true is that there? How true is that? We've all been there, I'm sure. Intended to spend time in prayer, but as soon as we quiet ourselves, all of these distractions, do you find that? Yeah? Do you find that? Just say, oh, oh, must remember to do this. Oh, sorry, just a minute, Lord. Oh, yeah, let me write this down before I forget. Yeah, all these distractions come to us. Our minds become very noisy. Every little sound interrupts us. And when there are no sounds, a silence is just as dis disruptive. And when the, we, we seek to quiet down, we immediately think of ten other things that we almost forgot about. that are really, really important to us. So we put off our prayers and eventually fall out of the habit of prayer. But there is one more reason why we don't pray that I want to mention today. Sometimes we fall out of the habit of prayer because there are no consequences to our not praying. We get into trouble, don't we? If we don't show up at work or at school or if we don't pay our bills or if we don't show up for jury uh, duty but pray. Nothing bad happens when we don't do it. So it becomes tempting to give it up. Life is so busy these days. We find that, don't we? We have all these modern... How did you women manage in the old days? Eh? 
without automatic washing machine, without dishwashers, uh, without these things to whisk the battery and everything else there. Eh? We think life is busy today. We're looking for ways to make it a little easier or just to get through the day and giving up doing something that no one knows about is very tempting. But prayer on your to-do list and, and when you do it, after doing the laundry and paying the bills, after something else that is squeaking louder, it's true, the noisy wheel gets the grease as the old saying goes, and prayer is usually not a very noisy wheel. So it gets left and left and left. And what happens when we don't pray? But you know what happens when we don't pray. According to Jesus, we lose heart. We lose heart. We get discouraged because our souls need prayer. Let me re repeat that. Our souls need prayer. Just as our bodies need food, who's eaten today? Yes? Had breakfast? Your favourite cereal? Your bacon, sausage, egg, fried bread? Yes? No. But just as our bodies need food to continue, our souls need prayer. Without it, it shrivels up. But what does it profit us if we gain the whole world but lose our souls? In Thomas More's best-selling book, The Care of the Soul, first published in 1992, he begins his introduction with these words. The great malady of the 20th century, implicated in all of our troubles and affecting us individually and socially, is loss of soul. When soul is neglected, it doesn't just go away. It appears symbolically in obsessions, addictions, violence and loss of meaning. Our temptation is to isolate those symptoms or to try to eradicate them one by one, but the most, but the root problem is that we have lost our wisdom about the soul, even our interest in it. Our souls need care, and the best way to care for our souls, pray, spend time with God, Otherwise, we lose heart. We get discouraged. Life becomes too great a burden to bear. Prayer is how we remind ourselves that God is with us, involved there in our life, in our world. Prayer helps us to see God at work in our life. Okay, but how should we pray? There are endless ways to the answer, not just one. Pray always. Not always, but all different ways. All different ways. Pray with short prayers. Pray with long prayers. Pray those quick prayers like arrows piercing heaven. Pray with others. Use written prayers, whether you write them yourself or prayers that have already been written. Pray with scripture, especially the Psalms. I do a lot of praying when I'm driving. I do keep one eye open. But the Lord doesn't care whether you've got both eyes shut and your hands together uh, there. It's very difficult driving with your knees. Uh, there, but I find I'm able to pray when I'm driving, especially on the motorway when it becomes a bit boring there.
but to bring things to the Lord, to thank the Lord. I find I'm one of those people, I pray about something, and when the Lord answers, I forget, forget to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Martin Luther, the great re reformer there, said, once wrote a booklet on prayer for his barber. Yeah? Enough of these wise words near the beginning of the booklet. He wrote this. First, when I feel that I have become cool and joyless in prayer because of other tasks or thoughts, for the flesh and the devil always impede and obstruct prayer. I take my little Psalter, his booklet, hurry to my room, or if it be the day and hour for it, to the church where the congregation is assembled. And as time permits, I say quietly to myself and word for word, the Ten Commandments, the Creed. And if I have time, some words of Christ or of St. Paul or some Psalms, just as a child might do. The importance of remembering scripture there. Remembering scripture. Pray with scripture. But if you don't have scripture handy, pray without it. As a famous spiritual director, Don Chapman would often say, pray as you can, not as you can't. Because there really is no wrong way to talk to God other than not to talk to God at all. So pray always, all different ways, so that you don't lose heart. At the end of today's reading there in verse 8, Jesus asks a simple question. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? When Jesus returns, will he find people praying? People who have not given up on God? If so, he will also have found people who have not grown weary and discouraged by life because they have continued to see God at work in this world. They have not given up on prayer. And may we be among them. May we be those who are faithful in prayer. Remember hearing about a, a lady, a Glaswegian lady up there in Scotland whose son was a bit of a renegade and was so often found in prison. And she prayed for 25 years that the Lord would take hold of his life. And God answered her prayer. Don't give up. Who of us have got children that are not following the Lord? Do not know Jesus as their saviour. Have we given up on praying for them? I have two daughters. One who when she was 17, because of our Christian principles, walked out on us and we haven't seen for the last 20 odd years. Another who is happily married, got a, I have a grandson there, and believes in God, but doesn't know Jesus as Saviour. I'm constantly reminded to pray for them, just as people prayed for me. When I was a scruffy 14-year-old, I haven't always been this tidy out of there. When I was a scruffy 14-year-old, they prayed for me. And I became a Christian, realising I needed to make a decision there. Continue in prayer. Continue in prayer there. Yeah, let's not give up. And if you feel, oh, well, you know, I'm not much of a Christian because we're, we're talking about behaving like a Christian, just remember this. Satan trembles when he sees even the weakest saint on his knees. And if Satan can keep us from prayer, we lose heart and we become discouraged. Don't let the enemy get to us. We're in a battle. There. Let's take hold 
of Ephesians chapter 6 and put on the whole armour of God there and not give up praying. I remember one of our uh, pastors praying about Ephesians 6 and he said the trouble is people put, put on the helmet of salvation but are walking around naked. They forget to put the rest of the armour on. Let's put on the whole armour of God. Let's continue in prayer. Continue meeting with the Lord that we might know him answering and him, his life in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you. Thank you, Lord. You had to remind your disciples about praying and not giving up. How much more us. Lord, you know our what kind of people we are, our weaknesses, Lord, and Lord, how often we forget. Lord, we pray that we might, uh, Lord, look to you. Help us, Lord, that first thing in the morning, Lord, we might not just give thanks that we're alive, that we have breath, but Lord, that we might spend a time with you. That before the day begins, we might indeed just have that time, that quiet time with you. And Lord, that therefore we might take you with us in our days, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our uh, final song, Amazing Grace.